Good evening, everyone. This is Shaitali Bagh, Chief of Bureau with Aviation and Defense Universe. It's a great evening, eve of Submarine Day, Indian Submarine Day. And today we are having with us Commodore AJ Singh, a veteran always ready to be with ADU on its chat room. And another uh, submariner with us today is Commander Dr. Shishir Sahai. He's a veteran uh, with Indian Navy, a submariner again. Submarine Day is celebrated every year by the Indian Navy on 8th December to commemorate the induction of the first submarine, the erstwhile INS Calvary, into the Indian Navy on this day in 1967. We are elated to have with us today Commodore AJ Singh. He's the Vice President of the Indian Maritime Foundation and heads its Delhi branch. In his career spanning three decades, he had the distinction of commanding four submarines and a fleet ship. He also served in the directorates of naval plans and uh, submarine acquisition at Naval Headquarters, which was involved in drafting the Navy's 30-year submarine construction plan and the 15-year shipbuilding plan, which are now we are seeing coming up. He speaks and writes on subjects regularly in India and abroad and is also involved with the Indian Industry Associations on defense procurement and Indianization issues. Along with us, we have Commander Dr. Shishir Sahai, a veteran with the Indian Navy, presently the Senior Group Leader, Vice President R&D with Wonderland. Dr. Sahai has been on board the ships and submarines and his deputation to DRDO has given him a technical expertise on the subject. He has authored and co-authored many journals and conference papers and delivered nearly 3,500 hours of lectures. Welcome both of you gentlemen and to take this discussion, to take this talk ahead, we have Sangeeta Saxena, the editor of Aviation and Defense Universe. Welcome man. Thank you so much, Atali, and welcome so much to the chat room of ADU, which is always waiting for such an opportunity every December. Commodore AJ Singh and Commander Shishu Sahai, welcome to ADU. Wonderful Thank to you. have you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Right. And uh, Commodore AJ, as always, we'll begin with you. Because we really would like to know, you know, it's the Indian Navy, an important day tomorrow. And we'd really like to know from you, sir, what is the status of Indian Navy's submarine strength? And how can we match up with our not so friendly neighbors, sir, China and Pakistan? Well, yes, it is a very significant day for the Indian Navy, in fact, for the country, and of course, for all of us submariners. The submarine arm completes 55 years tomorrow. Uh, from humble beginnings in December 1967, which Ali just alluded to, we are now a force to reckon with. We are only one of six navies in the world which can operate, uh, which has built its own and is operating uh, nuclear part ballistic missile submarines. Uh, we have a force level of 15 conventional submarines. We are building now, we're building these submarines in India. So I think we've come a very long way, uh, but I think we still have a very long way to go. Uh, there have been lots of you know, submarine acquisition in India has been a very uh, has not been a smooth process. We've had we've had phases where lots of submarines have come, and there's been big gaps in between when we haven't had a submarine. And at the moment, we are unfortunately facing one of those moments where, out of the 15 submarines that we have today, uh, 10 are almost 30 years old or more. So certainly, we need to uh, get the submarine building program into top gear now. Because firstly, for two reasons. Firstly, because submarines are complex platforms to build. So once you have developed that expertise to build a submarine, you should keep the production line going. You can't afford to lose the skills and then have to start reinventing the wheel all over again. That is one part of it. The second part of it is submarines take time to build. So the submarine programs that get initiated now, we will see those submarines actually uh, combat worthy maybe eight or ten years from now and onwards. Therefore, if we don't have a new program, we have, you know, you've heard of the Project 75, I'll probably come to that later. But if those submarines don't get, those programs don't uh, begin immediately, in the early part of the next decade, we are going to have a, a problem with the number of submarines that we have and their capabilities. And that is the time we have to worry about. You know, India is the preeminent maritime power in the Indian Ocean. We have no significant threat at the moment in the Indian Ocean. But the way the PLA Navy is expanding its, its naval forces, including its submarine arm, the way it's developing bases all around, 
uh, the way it is arming Pakistan, it is giving Pakistan eight new submarines in the next eight to ten years. So obviously there is an intention to well contain India. China needs the Indian Ocean to, if it has to dominate for its maritime dominance, it needs to needs the ocean space that the Indian Ocean provides. And therefore, for it to be the uh, predominant maritime power in the Indian Ocean, it has to contain India. And therefore, to we have to start uh, planning our force levels in anticipation of what is going to happen 10 to 15 years from now. So that's basically where the submarine arm stands. We are okay at the moment. We are, we are managing quite well. But we need to uh, get cracking straight away on our future programs. Well, that is really wonderful, sir. And sir, this time, you know, normally we are used to speaking to you alone. This time we have a youngster with us. And uh, the reason to get him on board was that we did a little survey sir, before Navy Day. And the maximum queries which came from the younger generation were that, how is it like to be in a submarine? Is it an enigma? Is it something which is, you know, just out of the world? And we thought, you know, let's have somebody to tell them, somebody who will be able to tell them what the life in a submarine is all about. So welcome, Shishir, to ADU for the first time. And, you know, our young uh, viewers and readers really would want to know, what is the life of a submariner all about? Thank you, Sangeeta, ma'am. And uh, as uh, as I mentioned already, it's it's an honor to be uh, for me to be sharing the same dais uh, as stalwarts like uh, Commodore Aja Singh. Uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, since you mentioned that the young people want to know what uh, life on a submarine is, first of all, let me tell them there are no windows in a submarine, so don't think that you know you can look out of a out of a out of a out of a dived submarine and and see the sharks and uh, and the beautiful coral reefs or or you know what whatever, whatever the 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 sea has to offer as far as natural beauty is concerned. So there are no windows in a submarine. In fact, uh, you know typically like I have served. Uh, in diesel electric submarines uh, uh, in the early uh, 2000. Uh, unfortunately, after three years, I, I was medically boarded out. But those three years which were there, I would say uh, with complete certainty, they were the best years of my life. Uh, and why so? Why so? Because, uh, you know, I often tell in my corporate experience to my youngsters also that in a submarine, submarine is one of those platforms that, where there is no, uh, no chance for escape in case anything goes wrong. Yes, there are escape mechanisms. But you know, you know the the situation changes so fast. Imagine you are at a hundred meters depth, and with every ten meter of depth you go down, the increase in pressure is by one atmosphere. So typically, at hundred meters, when we operate hundred to hundred fifty meters, you know it's about fifteen to sixteen atmospheric pressure. So even a small, uh, you know, small uh, error by a part of the crew can create an emergency, and the situation changes very, very fast. So though there are escape mechanisms, I would, uh, I would say. That you know, escape is is uh, is very difficult. So why am I telling all this? I'm saying all this because because we are kind of part of a shared destiny, so to say. You know, the kind of camaraderie which is there with, uh, within the crew with the crew is amazing. You are respected not for your rank; you're respected for your professionalism. So uh, people who 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 like to be professional, who like to, who like challenges who like you know uh, those those kind of uh, atmosphere where everybody is working together as a family i think for those people the submarine arm is is the best arm wherein you know it's it's like a shared destiny so to say that is number one i, I would like to say number two uh, the training itself uh, is is quite rigorous so first there is uh, the training at the submarine school at uh, ins satwana in vishakhapatnam where apart from the technical training which again is difficult you have to go a lot of physical training. First of all, even before that, you have to be qualified to be a submariner. That qualification, like as, as we all know, it's a voluntary arm. It's not necessary for everybody to become a submariner. Like in the army, it's not necessary for everybody to become a paracommando or to become a naval diver. So submarine arm is a voluntary arm. So you undergo a lot of physical tests, whether your body can handle those kind of pressures. <clears throat> and only when you clear those medical tests, you to INS Satwana for the for the for the physical training and the and the and the, and the technical training and then you go on board to the submarine and uh, why I am harping so much on the training perspective, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that during the training perspective uh, during the training phase, I clearly remember that you know we would really feel as if you are the submarine. 
you know you have your commanding officer standing behind you and you know he's he's rattling out emergencies after emergencies and you're like you know just in your space you are just giving the instructions and the sailors are are responding with their feedback and i personally and many of my friends could actually feel uh, ladies and gentlemen that here there is a wall and here there is a switch and you know the submarine is me i am the i am the submarine so to say so that's kind of professionalism that kind of involvement so to say i have i have never felt ever in my life so uh, i i really miss those days uh, and and the camaraderie with my men with my other co- colleagues i have never found it anywhere else but on the submarines i mean uh, really that is that is something which i really miss yeah absolutely i think that is actually very nice and so emotional and you know in the forces we really it's all about being together and the brotherhood which we have and uh, you know from here i would like to now go to commodore ej commodore ej one thing which i have always wanted to understand is do we have a great deficit when it comes to submarines and if we have one what would be the absolute numbers which would be a good number to have and how do we fulfill this deficit uh well there's a deficit in in certain ways you could call it a deficit or you may not call it a deficit it depends on a on a on a on a perspective i mean you know any navy would be quite happy to have 15 submarines and a nuclear ballistic missile submarine and more to follow but i think the indian navy for the kind of role it envisages over the next 15 or 20 years or the kind of not so much the indian navy i think it's more the kind of role the, the country wants to play on the global stage requires a certain maritime capability of which submarines are a very integral element because the undersea warfare battle the undersea battle space is going to be the deciding factor not only from a from a tactical perspective from an operational perspective and also importantly from a strategic perspective and as i said we are only one of six countries which can operate a ballistic missile which can which has built and is operating a nuclear powered ballistic missile submarine the only other five countries being the five big uh, five permanent members of the un security council because that is the ultimate weapon for strategic deterrence uh, a submarine has the capability to launch a ballistic nuclear missile from anywhere in the world at any depth uh, from an unknown unknown uh, location which is enough to deter an an, uh, an adversary from launching an attack because he knows there's a second strike going to come from somewhere so that capability itself is is tremendous then you have the attack submarines the attack submarines are nuclear powered submarines but they are conventionally conventionally armed with anti ship cruise missiles land attack cruise missiles like the tomahawk and these submarines are such powerful platforms that they can actually shape the maritime battle space and they are the perfect platforms for open ocean deployment i would i would probably say that they are probably the most lethal platforms at sea now that is one area where india is deficient and i'm using the word deficient very very carefully uh you are aware we leased ssn they called ssn you twice we leased ssn from Once from the years of the Soviet Union, from eighty eight to ninety one, and then we leased the second one from two thousand ten, or uh, sorry, two thousand twelve for ten years, which went back in twenty twenty one. And I understand there's a third one likely to be leased from twenty twenty five onwards. The purpose of leasing these boats is because they're very complex and very sophisticated platforms. Uh, obviously, before India embarks on its own SSN program, it wants to be very comfortable and very uh, conversant with the operation of. with operating maintaining building supporting these very very uh, uh, you know high end platforms and so obviously india recognizes the need to have ssns unfortunately uh, for various reasons the the program is getting delayed cost may be a factor or whatever the ccs ccs uh, approval has not come for the last two years we've been anticipating it but it hasn't yet been given now i think that is a major lacuna uh, as i said in uh, earlier these boats you know from the time i think that ccs approval comes it will take at least 15 to 20 years before we can commission the first submarine which means that we are already looking at a timeline of 2040 now any further delay we are going to further delay that ssn program coming in so that is something we need very urgently to get get started on that but because for two reasons one nobody no no foreign power is going to give you the technology you got to build it on your own therefore it will take that much longer and it will be that much more difficult to do it that many more challenges will come up so to to address those we need to get cracking on it straight away 
As far as the conventional submarine fleet goes, I already mentioned we have 15 submarines, but they are very old. We need uh, more new submarines, more contemporary submarines with contemporary technologies. There are some very contemporary technologies like air independent propulsion, lithium ion batteries. Uh, the torpedoes and missiles have become very smart. And you cannot go into battle in a, in a dense anti submarine environment, which the Indian Ocean is going to be very soon, with one arm tied behind your back, with either old submarines or poorly armed submarines. So, uh, uh, Chatali had alluded to the 30 year submarine plan. When the 30 year submarine plan was approved by the Cabinet Committee on Security in 1999, it looked at building 24 submarines by 2030. I won't go into the details of the plan, but that was the fundamental requirement with the intention that and the aging of old submarines and phasing out of old submarines, at any given time, the Indian Navy would have 18 to 20 modern conventional submarines. That was the purpose. So, if you ask me how many should the Navy have, well, I would say the Navy envisaged 18 to 20 would be a good number. In 2015, the Navy, with the changing maritime geopolitical scenario, the Navy had a relook at that and said, okay, we may not need uh, to build 24 under the 30-year plan. So, we'll build 18 conventional submarines and we'll build six SSNs, nuclear attack submarines. Because now we feel that the requirement for nuclear attack submarines is there. We have to operate in a larger open ocean environment and therefore we need that capability. So, ideally, uh, as per the Navy's plans, we should have 15 to 18 conventional submarines, modern new conventional submarines, not, not old submarines, armed with the latest technologies and the latest weapons and six SSNs. Then, of course, we come to the strategic program. Now, a submarine, as I said, is the perfect second strike weapon. Uh, a retaliatory strike being launched from somewhere in the oceans where nobody knows where the submarine is. So it can't be countered. It can't be preempted. So it's a lethal, it's a credible second strike uh, option. And a country like India, which has no first use as a cornerstone of its nuclear doctrine, has to have an invulnerable and credible second strike capability. Otherwise, you're a sitting duck. Now, uh, you you must have read that in mid-October, Arihan fired its first, it fired a ballistic uh, missile uh, and so that was a validation of its missile capability. In 2018, it had uh, done a deterrence patrol where, they, where the, all the complex elements of the uh, deterrence ecosystem from the National Command Authority to the submarine somewhere at sea were validated. So India now has a, has a validated second strike capability. But its credibility as a nuclear deterrent will only happen when we can keep one submarine out at sea at any given time. That means at least one SSBN on patrol. Because otherwise, if you have SSBNs coming in and out of harbor, you know the enemy knows when you're vulnerable and when you're not. To keep one SSBN on patrol, you need a minimum force level of four SSBNs. So India at the moment has already got commissioned one, Arihan. The second one, Arighat, is, on, is going to get commissioned very soon. She's at an advanced stage of trials. And the third and fourth boats, as I understand it, are under construction. So I think with that sort of program moving the way it is, definitely by the end of this decade, if not sooner, India would have four SSBNs in commission and definitely what we call a continuous at sea deterrence, CASD. We will be able to maintain that. You know, just, just as an aside, the Brits completed 50 years of continuous at sea deterrence in 2019. For 50 years, they've been able to keep an SSBN on patrol at all times. So that's the sort of capability you require. Absolutely, sir. And one thing which I'd like to continue asking you is that if there is a deficit, and uh, budgets do not permit construction, is leasing an option, sir? See, see the two things. You know, firstly, I think I personally do not agree with this budgets not, not permitting. Because the country has to take a call on where does it want to stand on the global stage. If you want to assume a particular position on the global stage, you have to be, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to have the hard power to be able to justify that position. You know, even in, at, the, at its worst, when, when the Royal Navy was cutting down on all its frigates, destroyers, everything, it kept its SSBN program going. It still built two aircraft carriers because they saw the logic of that. If they wanted to sit on the top table, they should have that power projection capability. So if India wants to be a global power, if it wants to sit on the global top table, it has to have that power projection capability. Now, where the money is found from, that's the, the money has to be found from wherever it's found. Yes, it is expensive. SSNs are expensive to build, but it's a long-term capability. You're not having to put, you know, a few billion dollars into a basket today. It's going to be spread over 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. So that call in India has to take, not the Navy. It's India has to take that call where does it want to be. And as far as conventional capability goes, 
well we are going to be uh, we are going to have a back to the wall china is going to put a lot of pressure on us by the by the end of this decade when they will have a carrier battle group in the indian ocean they are building a submarine base in bangladesh bna sheikh hasina now when you build a sub they are not building a submarine base in bangladesh for the two ming class submarines that they have given to bangladesh they are giving it because when they want to operate the submarine in the bay of bengal they have a, a logistic support facility for their submarines so we have to we have to be cognizant of all these developments that are happening around us and accordingly base our force structures on that absolutely sir and uh, now sir we move over to uh, commander sahai and one question which i wanted to ask you uh, shishir was that uh, you know we this query which has come in empty numbers is that how do we prepare to become a submariner what happens how do we prepare is there something special we need to prepare uh yeah uh um, yes uh, i would say i i honestly speaking of uh, the way i entered the submarine arm um, i know that uh, the entry mechanisms have changed and i was told some time ago that right at the entry level um, there is an induction to be in the submarine arm um, uh, of course uh, during our time it was slightly different it was like you know we are part of the surface navy surface navy when i say is part of the ships uh, of the of the indian navy and then they ask for volunteers and then we volunteer for it but i think uh, those things keep changing but coming to your pointed question again uh, sangeeta ma'am i would say it is uh, it is more of a mental attunement which i would say uh, you don't prepare for it uh, there is a medical examination which is held um unlike uh, if you are preparing for entering the diving cadre of the navy then yes uh, your question is very valid you need to be in top physical form you need to you know uh, uh, be sure that you will at least clear the diving uh, uh, criteria for the for the entry into the diving school and be in, in fact much more fit so that when you are going through those motions in the diving school at cochin you know you don't uh, all aside and you you complete the whole program so that kind of physical uh, uh tuning is required but for for being in the submarine arm i think uh, nothing of that is required uh, you are you have to be medically fit uh, there is there is one of the you know uh, procedures which they do that they put the volunteers into a compression chamber and then they increase the pressure gradually so you know you have to kind of uh, equalize the sinuses and the inner cavity so you know many people they are not able to do that while they are inside the pressure chamber and then they are medically unfit to be the part of the arm uh again to cut a long story short i think uh, you have to just prepare yourself mentally that you have to be able to stay in those confined spaces which are there uh, i remember uh, commodore sir i don't know how it was during your time but uh, the ekm submarines we know that they can carry 52 people but there are times wherein i have traveled with more than you know i've sailed rather not travel i have sailed with more than 100 uh, people on board as such uh, there are no beds for the whole crew even when 52 are sailing we do not have 52 bunks i think bed is a very wrong word we do not have 52 bunks as such we have a concept of hot bunking so to say so one third of the crew is always on on duty and one third and the two third get a chance to sleep unless uh, uh, of course if if the if the commanding officer is decent enough and not to you know pipe some emergencies so you know two third get a chance to sleep and uh, yeah i would say that you picture yourself in a in a 3 ac uh, third ac compartment of a train uh, that coupe of six seats and even smaller than that uh, and that is uh, your your sleeping spaces so to say you cannot even sit upright in your bunk uh, so that kind of a mental readiness is required more to say rather than uh, you know physically if you have this medical problem you have it if you don't have it you don't have it but uh, mental attunement and and the and the desire to be part of an elite uh, arm like like the para commandos or like the like the marcos or like the divers of the navy uh, or the or the air force uh, fighter pilots and that desire has to be really burning uh, that is what i would say my one question in which is mine absolutely which has been asked of course many times by many generations of youngsters is that uh, you're tall i mean both of you guys are really tall now how do you fit into this submarine you know do you always have to put your head down and walk or uh, yes. is it or can you stand straight both of you i mean could you always stand straight in the submarine 
like i i of course komodo sir after you please uh, you you can take that question then i'll tell you about my experiences <laughs> well yeah there are lots of places where you can't stand straight let me put it that way there are there are places where you can but then you have to look for those places where you can stand straight <laughs> and try and find that corner where you can stand straight and do whatever you have to do but yes it it, it is it is of course a constraint to be tall but uh, frankly speaking i don't think it's ever we ever felt it like a constraint it never felt it oh god i can't stand straight or i'm i'm having to bend so i think as as shishir has been has brought out so well it's it's a different sort of it's a different environment let me put it that way you know it's very difficult to describe what is it about a submarine that makes you a submariner or what drives you to become a submariner i think it's a little bit of that motivation it's a little bit of doing something different and let me tell you as he said it's a voluntary arm you can join when you want you can even leave when you want without it having a detrimental effect on your career you just go back into the normal navy and continue with the, with your with your you know with your work as usual but in my 18 years of 19 years of active submarining and i was actually on a submarine i think only one officer i am not talking only officers i am talking officers and men i think only one officer uh, chose to leave the arm because he did not enjoy being on a submarine let me put it that way he may have had his reason it may have been claustrophobia it may have been whatever and nobody held that against him but what i'm trying to say is that it wasn't the toughness of the life it wasn't that sort of 45 days underwater in that confined space you know with carbon dioxide being high etc cetera, etc cetera. just to lose among 60 people and at times 100 people as as he mentioned so so despite all that and shortage of water and despite all that just one person left in the 19 years that i did active submarine so obviously there is something that keeps people going <laughs> in the army thank you sir ma'am uh, since uh, i am i am butting in but since uh, commodore sir mentioned about about the presence of only two loos uh, or the two toilets on on the submarine i i really want to tell you uh, my my first uh, morning on a submarine and you know uh, we were under training yeah we we knew it after part uh, as part of a theoretical instructions what to do when you when you go <laughs> for your morning routine but you know i was just sitting there and suddenly something some announcement was done and it was i remember it was 5 o'clock in the morning so you were not at the highest level of uh, attention and suddenly i find a sailor just opening the door of the loo and operating some walls behind me and and vanishing and i was like my god that was quite a cultural shock that you know you do not even have that little space that personal space which everyone wants wherein you can you know you can do your morning routine and even that is not uh, afforded to you on on a submarine so uh that is that is that is the way the life is on a submarine i would also like to add to what commodore uh, sir mentioned uh, uh whilst i was in the navy i was part of uh, the naval electromagnetic compatibility center the naval emc center at bombay and uh, i got a chance to actually do the pre induction survey of of uh, our first uh, nuclear boat and i was shocked at the amount of or, or, or i was shocked at the lack of space which was there on the first boat and there were some equipment uh, ladies and gentlemen where you had to actually crawl you know literally you you can't even get on to your all fours you have to you know literally crawl like a commando to to go through those spaces to that equipment in case you want to access that equipment so that's the that's the lack of space which is there uh, in the equipment spaces or in the machinery spaces uh, um i'm sure they would have addressed these issues as 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 we evolve with our design of the of the nuclear submarines uh and yes on the ecams also and, and and in fact the russians are famous that you know they put in all the equipment and then they say oh why we have to put a man also there so uh, yes so that's that's the joke which goes around as far as their tanks their aircrafts and and the submarines and ships are concerned so definitely the machinery spaces the the sensor spaces the the electrical and electronic spaces are really really cramped up uh, even the ops room you can i mean aj sir has been has been kind enough to say that there are places where you can stand upright i i think it's just the ops room where you can stand upright but most of the places at all people like you and me have to literally be in this position you know so yeah so that's that's a, that's a long answer to to sangeeta ma'am's question and uh, you know it's wonderful actually to get your you know two different points of view which are very very similar huh? so it's so nice to understand these things from the perspective of a layman from the perspective of professionals like us who have seen the seen the submarine but you know never lived in it so we, we really do not know for us it's an enigma you enter the submarine oh wow that's a wow moment for us so i think you guys have really gone through it and i think the fact that you guys are in love with it it's a great feeling uh comrade ji 
I wanted to ask you about the weaponization of our submarine, the Indian Navy submarines. Is the weaponization absolutely state of the art? What else would you think could be added on to improve the stealth level? Uh, all all modern submarine designs, at the modern uh, conventional submarine designs, and I'm just sticking to conventional submarines for the time being, are are being incorporated with better stealth technologies, be it the quality of paint being used. You know, the Russian submarines had a rubber coating around them called an anechoic hull, which used to absorb all the uh, self noise. So there have been, as technology evolves, so do the damping and silencing techniques on board submarines, because the most important asset for a submarine is to not get detected underwater and remain concealed. So that is the most important thing. Uh, in so far as uh, weaponization goes, you know, the two, every submarine's two major weapons are, the major weapon, of course, is the heavyweight torpedo. And you now more and more submarines are capable of carrying missiles, which they fire through their torpedo tubes. Conventional submarines, again, I'm restricting myself to conventional submarines, the SSKs. So the Indian Navy at the moment has a fairly potent capability as far as its missile systems goes, because we've got this, we've got a club missile on the Soviet boats or the Russian boats. And that is a very powerful missile. It has a range. It has quite a considerable range. It has land attack capability. And uh, so that is a fairly potent platform. Uh, we also have boats of German origin. They are now, a couple of them are now being uh, uh, retrofitted with the missile system, which should have actually come a long time ago, but for whatever reasons it didn't, but now are being retrofitted. So I think despite the fact that they're old, despite the fact that they have, uh, you know, may not have the latest uh, uh, hull technologies and all, but they are still fairly potent platforms. We've been constantly refitting them. We've been doing medium refits, long refits, life certification, life extension programs. So we've been keeping pace with technology to a large extent in ensuring that these boats, despite their age, still can hold their own in a, in an, in a anti-submarine warfare environment. Uh, in terms of torpedoes, again, we have fairly good torpedoes. We have some very smart torpedoes. We could do with better. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, everything costs money. We don't have certain technologies in India. We're still in the process of developing them. Uh, uh, with the recent uh, sort of emphasis on Atmanir Bharata and self-reliance, personally, I think uh, that's my personal view. We are not going about it the right way. We're rushing into it. We should have gone about it in a far more measured manner. We should have given distinct timelines for everything. We should have put certain milestones to be achieved to reach a particular threshold by a particular year. Uh, this overnight decision to go Atma Nirbhar as if it's a, ma as if it's a magic wand is detrimental actually to, to uh, combat preparedness of the Navy. So I think that's an area of concern, but at least for the next, at least till the end of this decade, I think the Indian Navy submarine arm, despite the age of its boats, will be able to hold its own. Let me also tell you that you know, India lays a lot of, the Indian Navy lays a lot of emphasis on training and some sub, the submarine arm particularly so. Training is very important. And when I say training, I don't mean training in a training establishment. That of course is there. It's about training on board. We are constantly keeping our crews on their toes. As, as you should mention, commanding officer is doing nothing, but when he's doing nothing, he's sitting, he says, let's do some drills and emergencies. And the crews on drills and emergencies. Reason for that being, when that emergency happens, as he said earlier, it happens in split seconds. There isn't time to react. There's no time to think. The action should come to you instinctively. And that instinctive reaction only comes when you practice it so many times that you don't have to think and say, Achha, next order, kya hai? what am I supposed to do now? Because there's no time to think about what am I supposed to do now. You just want to do it. And you must not forget that each of the 60 people on board, including the cooks, have an equipment to look after. And any malfunction of the equipment or they making a mistake can take the whole boat down. It's not about the commanding officer making a mistake, which will make the submarine sink. Even the junior most sailor, the most inexperienced sailor, if he makes a mistake, he can take a boat down to the bottom of the sea. So that is the sort of emphasis that has to be laid on training. And I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I can say with justifiable pride that we have exercised with many navies. I have trained in the Soviet Union and the Soviets were impressed with the level of art of when we went there, they were impressed with how much we knew about submarines. They thought, you know, these green Indian submariners are coming, they're going to be very reliant on us for training. There were areas where we could tell them how they could do things better. So I think from that perspective, uh, the Indian Navy submarine arm can hold its own against any kind of opposition, but that should not lull us into a false sense of complacency that we can do it all the time. 
and com- and compromise combat capability or compromise on technology or compromise on ensuring that we give our best to our men who go out to fight because you know like i always say and this was taught to us in nda in war there are no runners up so bottom line but that was a great bottom line no in war <laughs> there are no runners up absolutely so perfect and uh, when we talk of submarine sir both i want to ask both you and shishir that uh, within the confined spaces uh, are there uh, cases or, or many cases of medical uh, problems happening to the sailors and the officers there because there was a report uh, which i went through in some of the for- from one of the foreign navies saying that you know the number of medical contingencies were becoming very high in the submarines so does that stand true true for our uh, navy also well personally sangeeta i don't think so i don't recollect in my you know number of years that i spent on board including five years in command of submarines did we ever have a serious medical case either an injury of course if something happens to a person he gets injured that that is an unforeseen thing but we never had cases where there was an infection or you know people fell ill just because the environment wasn't compatible and the um, environment is not compatible you know let me be very honest the submarine uh, environment that a submarine is very confined very constrained but and uh, fortunately even after so many years after having left we do not see any visible physiological problems in ex submariners you know so i suppose the indian the human body is very resilient it can it can take a lot of battery but no i do not think that there is any uh, it can be that health issues on a submarine arising can be generalized it could happen perhaps there was some infection at a particular time with you know we had covid we've had all kinds of things have happened perhaps an infection could have spread uh, in a submarine but not as a as a generic thing it's no it's not i mean we, we i think our crews are very healthy our uh, medicals are very very stringent we haven't had too many even even uh, even we haven't had too many low medical cases who had to be removed from submarines because they were they were falling ill very often or something yes if you have an injury or if you have a a problem like shishir unfortunately had a back problem because of which he had to sort of leave the arm that's a diff- that that's a different thing but no i would not say that uh, submarines lend themselves to more you know infection or people falling ill not in my experience <clears throat> Shishir, what about you? What is your experience? My experience, uh, Sangeeta Ma'am, would be that, uh, like like anywhere uh, in any any situation, whether in the services or outside the services, uh, your health is your concern. You know, you have to take care. Uh, yes, uh, the fact does remain that you know the spaces are constrained, uh, and you know, from a technical officer's perspective, I may say. that you know uh, if there is a you know just to give an example you know that that particular motor is gone bad or that particular equipment is not working so you have to remove three four other equipment before you can even reach that particular equipment and then you know you are sitting in a cramped uh, posture and you're working on it so you have to be aware that hey it's been it's been 30 minutes that you're sitting in this cramped posture now you have to get up and you know kind of straighten yourself or just do a little bit of limbering up uh and you know possibly that those are the mistakes which i did you know uh, i i didn't uh, i was not aware of those those things and especially when you are young you know you feel you can take anything but then one fine day the body uh, body gives up and in fact that is true even when we are working during covid sitting on our desks you know for hours and hours together you know uh, you have to be aware that hey it's been it's been an hour that you've been you've been sitting in this chair come on now get up and and just just go and just walk a few steps and come back so i i completely agree with uh, commodore ajay sir it's not that you know uh, it's uh, it's uh, physically it's something different uh, yes uh, when you talk about health you also talk about mental health uh, and uh, again as 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 commodore sir mentioned that you have to be uh, aware that hey, you are going to be in constrained spaces uh, and honestly speaking we are kept so busy uh, you know <laughs> i mean my experience you are kept so busy you don't get time to think you know you just you know you are on duty 1 by 3 as i said it's a 1 by 3 roster so you are uh, you are working you are on watch as we say in the navy for 3 hours and then you are off watch for for 6 hours but in those 6 hours uh, you know your commanding officer may may pipe some emergencies or some drills and you are taking part in those drills or like if you are a technical officer then you know some particular equipment is gone down so you are going and repairing it so you are completely busy so you don't get time to think about your family or or you know how constrained the spaces are you honestly you you don't uh, 
uh, get affected on the mental front also i mean that was my experience uh, ladies and gentlemen right absolutely and uh, you know as and when we uh, proceed with this point by one last uh, point to you shishir on this medical uh, you know factor is but do you have regular medicals like we have in the army and the uh, other na- part of the navy and uh, for the submarine is it is there some you know system by which you- you remain within the force you don't get uh, like in the air force you say you medically get grounded in the army it's a medical category so is there a very regular medical checkup is it every time you are going the submarine is sailing you do you have a regular medical checkup uh no at least not in my time uh, and and commodore ages sir can comment on this also but uh, yes you have your annual medicals and uh, again uh, we as a navy should be proud that we have uh, our own institute of uh, of underwater medicine uh, as we know uh, the situation underwater is completely different the uh, you know uh, so we we have it in bombay so uh, apart from your normal medicals which are there there are certain medical tests uh, which are done uh, by by the in- institute of uh, underwater medicine especially so during the time of induction uh, so uh, it's i mean coming back to your pointed question that before a submarine sails every time does the entire crew uh, go through a medical examination uh, my answer would be no at least not in my time uh, i i would leave the forum open to commodore aj to comment on that no sangeeta i don't think there is anything specific we do our annual medicals we have to remain uh, you know what the water in the army called shape 1 uh, to remain in the in the submarine cadre you can have a you may get a become a temporary medical category because of an injury or something that's separate you may go on board then but overall you, if you if you shape 1 we call it s1 a1 in the navy and you meet the uh, the you know whatever specific uh, uh, submarine related uh, uh, parameters which aren't very many really then uh, uh, you you are good to go on a submarine you remain in the submarine cadre uh, there is no medical as such every time you go to sea but yes once in 3 years you have to do something called an escape refresher you know the escape training course is a one month course and which shishir had alluded to and i wanted to add at that time that is the one course where after you finish that you say boy i'll never be able to escape from a submarine <laughs> if this is a sort of escape course i have to undergo <laughs> so <laughs> it's really tough and so that you have to do once in 3 years you have to do a refresher which which if you can do that refresher successfully you're medically fit let me tell you that <laughs> so, <laughs> so so that's all there is yeah and fact, uh, you know komodo reje when we talk of uh, you know when we spoke of stealth uh, earlier i also want to understand what are the anti submarine warfare capabilities we have and if there are some lacking how do we get them do can we uh, buy them from outside and get them fitted into our submarines what is the system i mean but that is the latest technology and of course uh, we need uh, absolutely need them to fight see undersea warfare we don't call it anti submarine now we call it undersea warfare that's the term because it's not only about submarine it's about a lot of other elements but undersea warfare is actually multi dimensional it's not only about uh, uh platforms which are under the water under below the surface you have you have uh, air asw platforms you have surface asw platforms you have unmanned platforms uh, now you have cyber and space coming in you have network uh, centricity so it's a much more complex maritime battle space or underwater ba- maritime battle space that we're looking at but to bring it down to the basics yes we have air asw capability that means we have you know you heard of the aircraft called the p8i uh, it's called a long range maritime patrol aircraft which has very potent anti submarine warfare capability and if really a submarine if anything worries a submarine it is getting detected by a lrmp aircraft because you don't know it's there if you had to break surface or something or you were you know not still close to the surface your dive were close to the surface uh there is a possibility there may be an lrmp aircraft in the air now he might be able to detect you because he's got sonar boys to detect submarines uh which he may be dropping and you are unaware of that so that is something that or if you're at periscope depth and you pick up a lrmp aircraft on your esm system because he's operating his radar and you dive what he gets is suddenly there's this little contact on 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 the surface of the sea which is which is disappeared so it's called a disappearing radar contact so he becomes suspicious that is it a submarine where that contact gone and so so there are various ways of 
sort of doing that. So one is the long range maritime patrol aircraft with its air, and they are also armed. So if they actually can confirm that there's a submarine there, they can actually launch a torpedo from the aircraft. So they are they are a potent threat. Then of course you have the anti-submarine warfare helicopters, which are basically the multi-role helicopters in an anti-submarine warfare role. We had the Sea Kings, we have the Russian Kamov 28, and now we are getting the Sikorsky uh, MR60 aircraft. So they are very potent again because they they operate from ships. So they fly ahead of the ships. Uh, uh, they hover in a place. They lower their sonars to pick up submarines if they suspect there's a submarine there. And if they pick up a submarine, either they carry out an attack with their own torpedoes, or they direct ships onto that submarine for it to be attacked. And if there's a helicopter in the air uh, and a submarine is deep, the submarine will not know that helicopter is there because there's no sound coming of the helicopter. Yes, there is something called a rotor wash. We call it a rotor wash because when he's hovering, uh, he's disturbing the surface of the water. If you have a really a, a very good sonar operator, he can probably detect there's a disturbance on the surface, but not always. So that is another potent uh, sort of threat. To counter that, now we are now there's Europe and Europe and all they're developing something called the anti-aircraft missile, which will be fired from a submarine. So it can probably take out a helicopter in the air. So there are technologies, you know, both for and against. For every submarine technology, there's an anti-submarine technology that's developed and vice versa. Then of course you have the surface ships. They can they all have sonars. All modern surface ships have both hull-mounted sonars, which are mounted on the hull. And now the new concept is towed array sonars. So the towed array sonar, it has a long array about extending up to 100 meters, 200 meters behind the ship, which trails the ship and picks up submarines. So the advantage of that is that it eliminates the self-noise of the ship. So it gives better detection ranges. Its own, the ship's noise is not, uh, is not part of that sort of, doesn't disturb its detection capability of a submarine. So that's another technology. So there are many technologies coming in, undermined, unmanned platforms are now becoming big. Uh, so there are various technologies coming in, uh, network-centric operations. A submarine picks up, is picked up by an aircraft, it can send in information to a satellite, the satellite can pass it to, to the ground, ground can send a whole fleet onto a submarine. And conversely, submarines too now, with, with advancements in technologies and communication technologies, submarines too are now part of a, a larger, earlier submarines to operate solo. You know, they were given a patrol area, they went there and they patrolled over there. Now they can operate in a in a more uh, integrated uh, battle environment because they also have capabilities to be able to transmit their information to uh, the other platforms. So it's a continuum of technology development, and it's going to continue because undersea warfare is going to be become increasingly important as we, the surface of the sea has become very transparent with satellites, with long range maritime patrol aircraft, and a whole lot of other surveillance uh, technologies, advanced surveillance technologies. The surface has become transparent. Surface forces cannot remain undetected for long. They can be monitored. Their movements can be tracked. So it's really the submarine which provides that capability of stealth, concealment, and and uh, you know being able to uh, 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 engage with the enemy from a position of advantage. So this right, is an ongoing process of of technology development. As far as we in India are concerned, I think a lot of work is going on in the ASW space. Uh, we are perhaps lacking somewhat in, tech, in, the, in technology. We can leapfrog that, provided we put in an enabling policy environment uh, to ensure that we are able to uh, uh, induct critical technologies and cutting edge technologies by getting foreign industry involved in a co-development, co co-production sort of a model and make them part of the Indian military industrial eco ecosystem uh, to work closely with Indian companies, provide them that sort of, uh, you know, that support for them to be able to leapfrog uh, uh, technology to the next step and 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 ascend the technology curve a little faster so that's where i would think that the asw capability lies all right absolutely and uh, commander sahai i wanted to ask you since uh, you know what is the system you know there was a very very common question which came up in our survey which was does the submarine have an internet? How do you communicate? What is the system? So today, the concept of communication is very different from what it was earlier. So just throw some light on it. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, as the uh, commander sir has been saying uh, that, you know, uh, stealth is, is the raison d'etre, so to say, of a, of a submarine, you know. So those, those luxuries of... <laughs> Of uh, ability of uh, being able to talk to your family is uh, is absolutely not there. I, I really don't know what is the situation now, but uh, 
i can really imagine that uh, those kind of luxuries uh, which uh, which at times may be given to sailors and officers on ships you know because they have a satellite communications uh, system and all those things are there sat phones are there uh, but uh, that is just not possible uh, to my mind uh, because it it uh, it completely defeats the purpose of of a submarine uh, aj sir uh, would you like to comment on that yeah well communication technique technologies have certainly uh, improved over the years when we joined obviously you know we had to come up to periscope depths just to receive a uh, transmission from a ship uh then uh, vlf came in very low frequencies came in so something could remain dive and and receive its messages then of course elf has come so that is all and now quantum communication is being spoken about so it's all going to keep getting it's evolving very fast but as she said the bottom line is that the submarine cannot afford to be compromised because its communication or a transmission was picked up by anybody so that will not happen uh what i was referring to was not communication as much as you know Uh, data links and tactical data links and all passing information through that not about talking to the shore or, or vice versa but yes uh, technologies are improving so there will be uh, submarines will be less compromised perhaps if in receiving their communications we used to have to pick a time to come up and receive our transmissions depending on the tactical situation hoping that we won't get picked up thinking we are this is a safe time so there were a lot of constraints at that time but definitely over the years things have improved the trailing wire antennas now and all kinds of things are there so uh, i think submarine communication is a big subject and i think once quantum communications quantum technologies take root in the armed forces in, in military applications uh, we are going to see a a transformational a quantum leap actually in in uh, in both technology in communication and perhaps navigation as well so we are poised for a transformational thing technology is moving so fast today that you know before you can say jack robinson you moved on to a new technology before you understood the previous technology fully so uh that is where i would say communication is there is a lot of possibilities nuclear submarines have to be able to communicate after all that ballistic missile submarine which is patrolling somewhere has to launch a missile at a specific time on a specific target with very precise coordinates or at an order from the national command authority which may be sitting ashore and be itself under attack so for that sort of an ecosystem to be uh, robust obviously you've got to have very advanced communication techniques in place and technologies in place uh commander sahai tell me one thing you know what uh, what are the opportunities a submariner face you know at both the levels especially at the sailor level and of course officers are always there uh, post retirement what do they get as a second career what is the sort of career because submarine is such a niche you know so uh, is there an opportunity for these guys who always been on the submarine and for, is there an opportunity for them in the civilian world to work and uh, you know make a career for themselves absolutely i mean of course uh, uh, sangeeta ma'am i'll be talking from the uh, possibly from a limited lens of of a technical officer uh, but uh, forget the submarines even the ships they are a platform wherein there is so much of uh, systems integration uh, and and i am really fortunate uh, you know i i remember when i when i joined uh, the national defense academy i was i was an army cadet and uh, i was one of those fortunate people who could ship from the navy uh, from the army to the navy in oh right by the way so right <laughs> <I. laughs> so uh, i i i got a chance to shift over to the navy in the fifth semester and i think that was the best decision which i have taken because in a ship or a submarine you are exposed to so many systems so the systems knowledge which you have is is fabulous you i mean i mean uh, I, the ekm submarines i i remember that you know they had nearly 40 systems which were there electronic hydraulic electromechanical mechanical so that kind of an exposure which is given uh, given to uh, an officer or or a sailor definitely holds him in great stead um, in 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 any uh, any venture outside you know even in my present job you know uh, you, we we talk about you know the the um, uh, the convergence of it and ot and they they say what is ot ot is nothing but the mechanical equipment and the electromechanical equipment it is all your software technologies your networking technologies so on and so forth now personally for me uh, it it is very easy to fathom because you know 
somewhere down in in the in this bald head all those things are there you know how the how the things integrate and how they work together in uh, in synchronism so uh, that training uh, or that exposure which is there and as uh, admiral as as commodore sir mentioned he was there on a submarine for 19 years so that systems understanding uh, sangeeta ma'am is is really uh, very precious i would say yes absolutely and uh, you know one question which has always been cropping up and uh, you know there was a very major query and this is to both of you you know girls who uh, now are going into nda also who is wanting to know why can't we be on the submarine so is it a b- good idea uh, is there a futuristic idea so i just wanted to understand from both of you uh, how good an idea is it okay well uh, without sounding uh, you know male chauvinistic let me say uh, as far as i my thinking goes i think there is no physical reason why women cannot be on a submarine or cannot uh, you know be equal to the men on board it's not about brute force it's about brains it's about it's not all about brawn it's about brain it's about adaptability it's about emotional stability and and there's nothing to suggest that a a a, a woman sailor or woman officer will be inferior in any way and i have never believed that also what i think at the moment is perhaps we in india are not ready for it while india is a path breaking thing but you know on land you can you can you can keep them you can you can make the social barriers still work uh, uh cultural and social barriers can still be maintained you can have a separate squadron for the girls in india you know things like that which is probably what they have at the moment but a submarine environment as as he mentioned you're hot bunking your 16 18 people in that little four bunk cabin you have only two loose on board so submarines are a very challenging environment and while there are navies in the world like the dutch navy and the british navy who have uh, women on board submarines even even the us navy has women on board submarines it took a long time for them also to understand and accept uh, women on board in fact when women on first permitted on board royal navy submarines the biggest objection came from the wives of the men not so much from the women on board so you know there are issues and india we are still i think socially and culturally i don't think we are really ready for that sort of integration of men and women into this sort of you know pressure cooker environment that the submarine offers i mean i'm sure there'd be parents who'd be scandalized if they heard that their daughters are cohabiting with men in a four bedroom space in a four bunk space you know changing clothes or even even conversing or or standing in line for the loo like he said somebody just opened the loo and started operating a valve you know i mean can you imagine that situation if if there was a lady in that loo so it will be a, it, it will happen it is an inevitability that will happen india we must understand the what drove european countries to get women on board was, the, was that they just didn't have enough men so they needed women also we don't have that problem but and it's an in, inevitability that will happen if 10 years ago you had said to me when i was a battalion commander in india that i was a battalion commander in india in 2004 that in 2022 there will be women in the nda i would have thought yeah maybe perhaps could happen but wouldn't have said said too much in store by that but it's happened rimc has got girls now you know all these male bastards are slowly crumbling so one fine day the submarine bastards might also <laughs> might also crumble but uh, like i said it's it's it will happen but it it should be it should happen when it is right for it to happen we shouldn't rush into it because it can have major repercussions i'll i'll add to what uh, what commodore sir mentioned uh, sangeeta ma'am like i remember uh, you know i i gave this incident uh, that you know there were two or three sorties you know five day sorties six day sorties when we went with you know more than 100 uh, crew strength when when the design crew strength is 52 and uh, you are like tired and you you just you want to catch a nap and i remember that you know i just behind the switchboard i'm just lying down and you know next to me there is a sailor who is lying down and and uh, i know even within within our own mental makeup uh, you know an officer and a sailor you know sharing the same space just to catch a wink is is unheard of you know because uh, the the forces are are fairly regimented and you know uh, it is it is a, a mental jump so to say but to expect that you know um, a lady officer or a lady sailor is just catching a nap and next to her uh, there is there is a sailor officer or or or, or a, a male sailor or a male officer just you know lying down and catching a nap 
I would I would rather say the the women are ready for the submarines, but possibly I don't know whether whether the submarines are ready for the women. I would like to summarize that way. We'll have to take a lot of care from the design perspective, from the habitation perspective, and then as as Komlor sir said, at what cost? You know, are, do we want to make our submarines floating hotels? But then that that uh, defeats the very purpose, right? Well, that's wonderful. Then you know, and uh, after hearing you guys, I think it'll be great when girls, uh, you know, plan to get into the Indian Navy and or do get into the Indian Navy. They, their, they, their families will really have food for thought. But uh, sir, now that we are coming to the end of the conversation, my uh, last two questions, sir, and which will be absolutely, uh, you know, to both of you. What do you see? as a way forward for the indian submarine arm of the indian navy and also sir does do we is it a relationship the submarine has with the a, a navy yes it's a part of the navy but do we see some role some relationship uh, uh, on it with the future prospect of integrated battle groups sir, which india is planning how can submarine be a plan of it with all the three forces together uh firstly come to your first question the submarine is going to be an integral part of future uh, warfare at sea because as i had said earlier it is the only platform which is which still operates in a fairly opaque medium and is not therefore is not susceptible to de de detection as easily as surface forces are and technology is continuously evolving so maybe 20 years down the line you won't see a submarine operating the way a submarine operated in the 60s it would have evolved it will be operating in a different kind of environment with a different medium in a different manner but that platform will remain there will be a lot of emphasis on unmanned platforms but still again the manned platform will remain strategic deterrence will remain so uh, the relevance of the submarine will never go away you know when the cold war ended in 1991 uh, and the sort of you know the soviet versus american that submarine cat and mouse game came to an end everyone thought that well now things are going to ease off you know submarines are not going to remain as relevant as they were but the one thing that remained if you really carry out an analysis is that notwithstanding navies cutting down on budgets and force levels being reduced the submarine arms did not reduce their capabilities of all these navies and the big navies continued to develop nuclear ballistic missile submarines despite the fact that the cold war had ended and everyone thought well it's that era is over but it did not get over so there is there is merit to assuming that this platform is going to remain it's going to remain relevant it's going to be an integral part of the maritime battle space but when you come to something like an integrated battle group now frankly speaking i have not understood this concept of an integrated battle group in a combined environment i can understand an army's integrated battle group because i can't see a submarine being part of an integrated battle group somewhere in, in kashmir so the point i'm trying to make is we are probably looking not so much from a maritime perspective not so much as integrated battle groups as a theater command concept perhaps you know where uh, you can bring your you can open a front from the sea to support the battle on land uh so that is definitely a reality and that is why today submarines have things like land attack missiles if i have a land attack missile that i can fire from 300 kilometers away i i can operate my submarine in such a way that i open a front from the sea also against a against a continental adversary in our case well hypothetically let's take our western neighbor we have the complete arabian sea at our, we have control of the arabian sea and so that's a new front the tomahawk missile uh the americans literally pulverized iraq and afghanistan you know by sheer tomahawk missiles fired from submarines at sea so they didn't even know where the missiles were coming from so is submarines and the underwater maritime domain are going to continue to remain important even in a in a in a tri service uh, scenario which we generally call an operational theater of war or at a strategic level definitely going to be very relevant and that is why i keep reemphasizing that it's time we started building our ssn program because that is the sort of opposition india is going to have to face 10 to 15 years from now does that answer your question <laughs> i'm not sure okay thank you so much sir it was really wonderful what a conversation we had today and it was so good you know to 
take the subject in its absolute wholesome exercise and it was great speaking with you both wonderful to have you here sir and hope to you know all the best to the submarine arm hope to see you all and everybody who's a current submariner and the indian navy with this arm progressing and making it a real part to reckon with thank you so much sir and we take you back to chitak thank you sangeeta and wish you all the best i hope everything works out well <laughs> i don't recall having such a, a great uh, panel uh, discussion where we discussed uh, about the inside of the submarines all the details and everything and also the technical aspects it was really great to listen to both of you and i really thoroughly i myself i thoroughly enjoyed i mean the life inside a submariner at the same time it um, uh, uh, is saying we haven't spoken to you about uh, the life inside the submarine ever i i don't recall doing it but uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, adu's best wishes and congratulations for the submarine day to all of you thank you so much sir and thank uh, you Jatali. that was very nice uh, being with you all <laughs> as always thank anything you. with adu is uh, is always fun of course <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank, thank you, you ma'am bye night